By God's grace, I'm still standing. It's been rough. It's only been six months into the year. It's crazy how things have changed, how things happen. It's just, I just thank, I just thank the Lord for his grace. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for his grace. I surely wouldn't be standing up here if it wasn't for his grace. You'll stand with me. We'll get into it. We're going to turn to Galatians 5. We're going to read 16 through 18, and then we're going to step, skip down to 24 and 25. If it wasn't for his grace, I should have been dead probably by 25. I'd have been dead or in prison. That's not an exaggeration. That's probably more like a fact. That is statistic. I should have been dead by 25 or in prison. But God's grace, he said, uh, hold on, big dummy. I got a better life for you. You there say amen? <clears throat> so Galatians 5, 16 and 18 read, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth after the Spirit against, sorry, excuse me, lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that they so ye cannot do that the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. We're gonna skip down. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. If we live in the spirit let us also walk in the Spirit. I want to talk to you a little while about this life as a believer. This life that should be lived in such a way that we stand out from amongst the crowd. To walk in the freedom that the Lord Jesus gave us. To live in the Spirit. And to live this life walking in the Spirit. Let us pray. Stretch your hands this way, Father. I love you, Jesus. I love that you saved me and put my feet on the right path. I love that you provide and care for us. I love you for all that you do. I pray that you would help us in this meeting. Anoint me to preach, ears to hear and hearts to receive. I pray, Lord, that you would have your way in this service. I pray that you would show us your glory and everything that is done. We will give you honor, glory, and praise for it in the mighty name of Jesus. And all that loved him shouted. <coughs> Amen. In this letter that Paul is writing to the Galatians, he's writing about the freedom they have in Christ, the liberty that they have from the law, and the power that they have in Christ's spirit, the false teaching that has slithered its way into the Galatian church as Paul's feathers ruffled. Paul was passionate about his children, right? He was passionate about his word. These are his little children. He has brought these individuals to Christ. They are now being fed rotten bread. The apostle will not stand by and watch it happen. He's going to voice his opinion and his concerns. Paul's grieving for his children. He's going through birth pains again, not for their salvation, but for that Christ would be formed in them. Christ's likeness and God's full objection for his people to walk in the spirit. The motives of the false teachers, they differ from Paul's. They want a following, whereas Paul is worried about their spiritual well-being. And what is the false teaching? Legalism. Legalism requires men to keep the whole law. Legalism makes Christ of no value. Mm -mm. The false teachers come in, insist on believers being circumcised for salvation, they're mandating their laws on top of them. They were looking for a system based on good works for salvation. Paul tells them that to demand on circumcision is to make Christ of no benefit. What they were doing was putting Abraham in the place of Jesus. Mm, we see some of that today, don't we? Since the Jewish teachers made so much of Abraham and insisted that believers must follow his example by being circumcised. 
Paul turns to Abraham's domestic history to show that legalism is slavery and cannot be mixed with grace. God had promised Abraham that he would have a son. Even though he and Abe and Sarah were, naturally speaking, too old to have children. Abraham believed God and was justified. Time goes by. Sarah becomes discouraged, waiting for the promise of that son. She wants to believe. But we all know that time wears us down, don't it? So when a suggestion that that Abraham should have a child to fulfill Abraham's want, desire, whatever you want to call it, she suggests that Abraham take her slave, maiden, Hagar. Abraham followed her advice, and Ishmael was born. This was not the heir promised by God, was it? But the son of Abraham's impatient carnality and lack of trust because Abraham got wore down too, didn't he? Well, you got to figure it was, what, 25 years he waited? This is the son of the flesh. Then when Abraham was 100 years old, the promised child arrived. Isaac was born. Obviously, the, the <laughs> this birth was a miracle. I don't want to have no babies when I'm 100. It was made possible only by the power of Almighty God. At the customary feast and observance of the weaning of Isaac, Sarah, she sees Ishmael mocking her son. She then ordered Abraham to throw out Ishmael and his mother, throw him out of the house, saying, The son of this bondwoman shall not be the heir with my son Isaac. This is the background for the argument which Paul is now going to take up and plead his case. Paul uses the law in two different senses. The first reverse of the law is a means to obtain holiness. It's not by acts that we are holy. It's not because we do a certain thing or we we only dress a certain way or we only act. That's, that's not it. All those things will show up on the outside when holiness is on the inside. When Christ lives in, he will shine through. The second refers to the Old Testament books of the law. Paul is is saying, tell me, you who desire to obtain favor with God by keeping the law, do you not listen to the message of the book of the law? Don't walk in the way of the law. Walk in the spirit. The two sons were Ishmael and Isaac. The bond woman was Hagar and the free woman was Sarah. Ishmael was born as a result of Abraham's scheming intervention. And then how we get, we're going to, uh, Lord, take it too long. Let me, let me stick my hand in this cookie jar and stir things up. It's not how it's supposed to be. We're just supposed to walk. Now turn it from the left to the right. We're just supposed to go. But it's a hard it's a hard walk. It's a fine line sometimes of what we have to we have to travel. Isaac, on the other hand, was given to Abraham by the promise of the Lord. The story is symbolic. It has a deeper meaning than at first glance. The real significance of the events is not stated but is implied. The true story of the two sons represent deep spiritual truth, which Paul is is now going to explain. The two women represented two covenants. Hagar is a covenant of the law. Sarah is a covenant of grace. The law was given at Mount Sinai. The name Hagar means rock in Arabic. And the Arabic people call Mount Sinai the rock. The covenant given at Sinai produced slavery. Why? Because it's all fouled in the hands of man. Thus, Hagar, a slave girl, is a type for the law. Hagar represents Jerusalem, the capital of the Jewish nation, and the center of unsaved Israelites who were still seeking to obtain righteousness by keeping the law. These people, together with their children, their followers, are in bondage. For Paul to link unbelieving Jews with Hagar rather than with Sarah, 
That was probably a slap in the face. With Ishmael rather than with Isaac. That was a stinging characteristic. The capital city of those who are justified by faith is the heavenly Jerusalem. It is the mother of all believers, both Jew and Gentile. Paul quotes Isaiah 54 and 1 in his, in his letter to the Galatians to make his case. The scripture he uses is a, a prediction that the children of the heavenly city will be more numerous than those of the earthly Jerusalem. Sarah was a woman who for so long was barren. Hagar is a woman with a husband. How did Sarah triumph over Hagar? Through the power of the Lord, through the promised child. The, the children of the promise include all Gentiles and Jews who come to God by faith. True believers are born, not, a, not of the will of man, nor the will of the flesh, but of God. It is not nature's descent that counts, but a divine, miraculous birth by the faith in the Lord Jesus that trumps all. Ishmael mocked Isaac, and it has always been true that those born of the flesh have persecuted those born of the Spirit. Hmm. Considering the suffering of our Lord and the Apostle Paul at the hands of unsaved men, it may seem trivial that Ishmael should mock Isaac, but Scripture records it for a reason. And Paul sees it as a, a principle that still abides, the war between the flesh and the spirit. Now Paul asked the people of the church of Galatia a question. What does the Scripture say? It says, cast out the bondwoman and her son. Law and grace cannot be mixed. It is impossible to inherit God's blessings on the basis of human merit or fleshly effort, right? Those who have trust in Christ have no connection with the law as a means to obtain divine favor. They are children of the free woman, and they follow the social con condition of their mother. Do they... They do good works because they are free, because they follow after Christ, because they walk in the Spirit. The word walk in the, in the Bible is often a metaphor for practical living. The Christian life is a journey. We are to walk in it, to live in it, to make consistent forward prog progress. The Spirit must give us life in the new birth. And we must continue to live day by day in the Spirit. To walk in the Spirit means that we yield to the Lord's control. Man, that's the tough one, right? That's the hard one. We can do all this, and I, and this is why they they all use this as a measuring rod. Oh, we, we did all this, Lord, and we did all this, and we did all this, and we did this. Lord, we did what? Oh, you want a total control, but we didn't Oh. And that's where we get to, right? I was, it's been probably a couple of years. Church was over. And um, it was just me and Tegan in here. And she was, I don't know, two or three. She was still a little pistol. She was a handful. So she gets over here and she falls. And I reach my hand down to pick her up. She swats the hand away. And I'm like, well, you little punk, grateful turd. And the Lord says, well, isn't that how y'all treat me? And I'm like, ooh, ooh, you're right. So when the Lord reaches down to help us, I got this. I got this. I'm going to live my way. I can do it, Lord. I got it. I'm going to do it. I'm going I'm to do it until I can't do it no more. And I've messed it up so bad that I need you to come in and fix it. That is not the way it is supposed to be at all. No way is that the way it's supposed to be. It just can't be. We get involved or we get in our feelings and we make a mess. Like a tornado went through there and the Lord says, really? Now the kicker is that he already know we were going to do that. So he's already, he's already... Yeah, I will fix it. I already know what's going to happen. How would the outcome be any different if we already would just do what we're supposed to do? 
would things go? Well, I'm sure they would go a lot smoother. The Lord wouldn't have to fix as much stuff, though, right? But that's what we we have to we have to follow His lead. We allow Him to exert His fluence influence over our lives to walk in the Spirit and to not resist Him. That's the tough part. Because I think sometimes we, we want to hold on to stuff. What? I don't have that. Lord, uh, I'm coming to you, whatever you're seeking for, uh, healing, Holy Ghost, salvation. Actually, uh, anyway, uh, you got to get rid of that. Huh? What? Uh, this is my, oh, man. Lord, I really want to get rid of it, though. Like I read a story of, <laughs> I think I read a story or heard a story or something, but a guy that was seeking for the Holy Ghost, and every time he went to pray for it, all he saw was carrots. And finally he was like, <sighs> he had to go back to his hometown. And his his family friends or his, his friend's family growing up owned a, what a jiffy store, like a farmer's market, and they had a bunch of, uh, fruit and vegetables in there, and they used to go by after school and steal carrots, and they would eat them. And uh, so, as he's years later, it was probably decades now, and he's praying for the Holy Ghost, and the carrots would pop up, and he's like, "Oh man!" So he goes back, and he he tells the the man who runs the store, he says, "Hey, I need to pay for these carrots," and he said, "Why, well, son? Well, because we used to come in after school and steal all the carrots and eat them." He said, oh, we all did that. He said, no, you don't want to get it. He said, uh, I, I, I got saved and the Lord turned my life around and I, I'm, I'm seeking for the Holy Ghost and uh, I can't get it unless I pay retribution for these carrots. It's okay. Now nah, I got to pay for these carrots. So he pays for the carrots and the next service he goes to, he got the Holy Ghost. But that's it. We have to obey. Whatever it is, you know, if it's, and don't pick that quarter up because that ain't yours. Mm. You know what? Lord said, don't touch it. I ain't touching it. Right? Galatians 5 examines the work of the Spirit in the believer, the, the contents of the freedom from the law and the power that we have in this walk, the power that we have to walk in the Spirit. Those who walk in the Spirit will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. The flesh our fallen nature under the power of sin is a direct conflict with the Spirit. When the flesh is in charge, the results are obvious. See verses 19 through 21. But when the Spirit is in control, mm, he produces godly qualities within us. Believers must crucify the flesh with its passion and desires so we can fully walk in the Spirit. The other day I went to work, and the guy that I've been, I've been ministering to and and that guy delivered from gambling comes to me. He says, man, I'm kind of annoyed. I said, why are you annoyed? He said, man, you remember the other day we were out here and I was ministering to him. Uh, I don't know. We were probably out there about five minutes. And he said, man, we were out here talking. And uh, the service manager walks by, right? Um, I've known him for a long time. But anyway, he walks by and he's kind of glared at us. And I got this weird feeling. And um, so I... But he never said anything to me. And so anyway, he goes on and he walks away from us. You know, he don't ever say, he doesn't address us at that moment. And um, so anyway, um, he's like, yeah, man, I, I guess, I guess when we were out here talking the other day, he, uh, they came to me and told me that I can't be talking to the mechanics anymore. And I'm like, are you referring to when Doug walked by and saw us talking? He said, I, he said, I guess it's the only time that I know. I said, well, he obviously knew what we were talking about. It was not like we were trying to keep it quiet. We were talking about Christ. And he was struggling with some stuff, and so we were just kind of, I was kind of ministering to him, and we were just kind of talking back and forth. And I'm like, I find that funny. And he's like, why is that? I said, because the other day I felt a, I felt something weird when I got to work, and it was more of a, it was some kind of, I don't know, I can't explain it. Uh, if I tell you, you'll probably understand, but it was a spiritual shift it felt like. The atmosphere had changed at that place, and I'm like, 
Huh. Well, they were all gun ho for Jesus. Until their apple cart gets upset, right? You got a guy that gets delivered, and he's all in the office telling everybody he can. They believe that eh, you don't got to live a certain way to make it to heaven. They believe that you don't really have to go to church. You don't have to do this, and you don't have to do that. And Christ paid it all in one shot so I can drink wine and whiskey and smoke my cigars and play golf and all that nonsense and Christ covered it all the bad thing is is me and this individual that I uh, was talking to at the time have been preaching against that I'm dude sorry that's not the way it works I don't, I don't just kick the door down and go inside and tell them but if they ask me I'm going to give my opinion and what the word says. That's not what this says. It says, repent. You have to give all that up. Oh, man, you got to live that way. That's that's fanatical. That's for the older. That's for the generation way. In the, no, dude. That's, I don't read where it says, by the year 2024, you don't have to live that way. If you've seen that, then I want you to show it to me. Because my word says that Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But that's the just. And I think, I think there's some, I don't know. I think there's some, I don't want to say jealousy, but I think there's some standoffish. They don't really... I don't really know how to take it, maybe. I told him, look, I said, I can get my feelings all day long about it. And it ain't going to change nothing. I said, man, you got to walk in the spirit. I said, just, just overlook it. You do what the Lord says to do, right? That's where we're supposed to be. That's what we're called to do. Those who walk in the spirit are united with Christ. And are the bearers of the fruit of the Spirit. That's what they're going to produce. We were saved by the Lord Jesus. When he pulls us from the depths of sin, he cleans, he cleans us up and he makes us new. For what? For us to work for him? To wage war on the enemy? I got to thinking about this. The old adage is, he who lives by the sword, dives by the sword, right? So if you go out and pull a sword on somebody and you constantly are in battle, guess what? more likely you will die by the sword. The blade will eventually take you. Same thing with a gun. If you go out and you constantly are fighting a gun battle, eventually you're going to die by that gun battle. Now, you might be the, the few that make it out unscathed, but I doubt it. You know, that's just statistics. Maybe 2 to 5% don't actually die in the battle, but the majority of us will. So I got to thinking about this from my message last Sunday. Do we live by the sword? And will we die by this sword? So twofold. So if we die by that sword, for one, we're going to die for Christ on the altar, and we're going to be his disciple, we're going to be his servant, right? The other thing is if we live strictly by that word, the world will want us dead. Because you have to figure I mean, God's going to send, in the, in the tribulation, he's going to send two individuals. They're going to preach repentance and that God's wrath is coming. Then what's going to happen? Nothing's going to be able to touch them until God, can, God says that's the way it's going to happen, and then they're going to die and be on the street, and everybody's going to see this, and then they're going to resurrect. They're going to hate them. They hated Christ. They hate, they hate us. Well, they hate a true believer, I should say. If you can be mixed, then that's bad business. We're going to wage war on the enemy. We become the Lord's spiritual weapons, a weapon for war. And like any weapon, we must be forged in the fire, right? 
The fire purifies. It takes out the impurities of the metal and makes it stronger. When they put a blade into the metal, they heat it up and they constantly bend it over and they they beat on it and they beat on it and it gets stuck back in the fire and they fold the metal because the impurities come to the top of that sword and they stick it back in there and they get it hot after they beat it some more and they finally, when they folded the metal so much that the impurities are all out, then it's time to take that sword and give it a blade. They start to give it an edge and they start to shape it. They get all the impurities out and they fold that steel so it's less likely to break. Man, and that's how we get. We get stuck in the fire. The devil beats upon us a little bit. Right? Am I the only one to go through that? That's good. Then guess what? We get out. Whew, Lord gives us some strength. We're right back in the fire. Right back into getting beat up. So we can become a, a great instrument. A war for this kingdom that we proclaim. The weapon of the sword, to be useful, it has to have an edge on it. To have that edge, the sword has to go through hell to get it, right? It has to be forged by the refiner's fire. All the impurities must be burned out. And we look at the three Hebrew boys, and they get thrown in the fire. And the only thing that was burned off of them is what the world put on them. It was the ropes of Babylon. That was it other than that. They didn't smell like smoke. They didn't smell like fire. Christ was with them. And when they came out, and with the hair singed, there was there nothing tarnished. They came out to proclaim the gospel. To truly walk in the Spirit. I've often told you about the story in 2019 where I had the, the pain in my side. I was some rough junk. I think now we kind of chalk it up to kidney stones. That was that was a rough deal. But if I had succumbed to what the flesh wanted what would have happened? A lot of stuff would happen. There wouldn't have been a testimony. I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have played that night. We, we, there was a youth revival going on. There would have been no music. It showed, it showed me some stuff. It showed Manda some stuff. And some and Brother Jamie and the church. There was a lot, there was a lot going into that. It wasn't just about me being in pain. If I hadn't seen that, then that'd have been rough. Right? We don't often look at what's going on, how we are supposed to react. We just react. The last couple of weeks, I'll say two or three, it's been rough. I'm not going to lie to you. I've almost come to the point, I'm just going to tell Brother Jamie that I'm done. I can't do this anymore. That's where I've gotten to. And I'm just like, I've kind of hit it in myself. I've kind of backed up. I'm just. So then as I did my message last week, I'm like, this don't make any sense to me. Then this morning, this morning we we're talking about what we, what we are. Brother Jamie is constant. And Paul is, does anybody know? Besides the people that were there, what I would be, you could say hard-headed if you'd like. Hard-headed. I'm driven. Amanda often equates it to a dog with a bone. I worked with a guy one time, and I was I couldn't I was trying to get something, and I couldn't. He's like, "Son, you like a pit bull." I got it. Sleep on. You like a pit bull. You ain't gonna let go, are you? I got to get it done. 
I got to figure it out. It's got it's a task. So yes, I am task driven, but in determination in that task. When I used to go to the gym, a guy would I have my headphones on, and a guy would come to me, and eventually, probably a couple of weeks, and he was like, "Yeah, I think he called me with my headphones out one time. I think I was at a water fountain." And uh, he's like, hey, man, I, I've been wanting to approach you for a couple of weeks, but you're just kind of uh, unapproachable. Now, at the time, I was not saved. So I was like, yeah, well, here you are. And he's like, but you look so mean. I'm like, I'm not mad. He's like, you sure you're not mad? You look awful mad. I said, no, nah, you know, I'm, I'm determined. I'm driven. One of two things are going to happen today. When I step my foot into that gym, I'm either going to kill myself or that, or that machine. And then so as we were we were talking, and I'm like, the last couple of weeks, I've just I've been so tired, I've been wore out, I've been drained, and I don't understand why. I'm like, maybe I'm fighting off something. Maybe I'm getting old. I'm not that old. I'm like, good night. What in the world? I do work out in the elements. We don't really technically have a shop, so maybe it's heat, but it's never really bothered me before. So me and Amanda were talking, and I'm like, I've always been driven, and here lately, I'm just like, I want to be done. And then it hit me. <laughs> it's an attack. It's a spiritual attack. I can feel a couple weeks, I was going to say a couple weeks, a couple of months ago, I'm like, man, something's something's going to happen. Something for the positive, not for the negative. Here, something with this church is going to happen. Something's going to shift. I can't tell you when. I just felt it. But then within the last couple of weeks, though, I've just felt drained. I can't. I also want to give it up. And I'm like, uh uh-huh. Okay. And then it hit me. Stupid. You should have saw that. It's a spiritual attack. Because if he can get all any other players out of the game, he's got a better chance at taking out whoever. And if and whoever's calling is whoever's calling is not there to be fulfilled, right? Because the Lord once told me, it's not many people depend on your walk, is what He told me specifically. Many people depend on your walk. So do we look at it like that? It's not about us. It's not about how we're feeling. It's not about how we're doing. Yep, I'm still breathing. I chalk that up as a as a good sign. The devil ain't killed me yet. And he's tried. Sometimes it gets hard in this walk. Sometimes we zigged when we should have zagged. Sometimes we don't always, I don't think sometimes it's not a matter of obeying. Sometimes we just don't, maybe we hard-headed and don't listen. Sometimes the Lord doesn't say anything and, and we're like, is that the way I should go? Is that the way I should go? Lord, which way should I go? You're not saying anything to me. I'm just, do we just... We get on to Gideon for, let me flip this over. All right, Lord, if there's dew there, nope, there's no dew. <laughs> we look at Gideon and be like, man, you didn't have no faith. Uh, sometimes it gets hard because you don't know which way to go. You reach a fork in the road and you're like, all right, Lord, is it left or right? Where you at? And then you pray and you pray and you pray. And maybe you come up here and it's and it's late at night and there's and it's all dark and there's you know noises things shutting or is that you? But there's no answer. We don't know which way to go. We're praying and we're praying and we're seeking and we fast. You know, we fast and we still don't get no answer. And it's like, when are we supposed to? But we have to move. Is it left or right? Where's the fork in the road? 
Maybe we take the right one and then we realize about halfway down, this is not it. So maybe some of that's to, to teach us because if we're fully walking in the Spirit, it should all just glide smooth sail, right? I think that's where Christ indwells, right? A saturation. I would have that's my that's my logic. That's not scriptural. If we if we allow everything to overtake us or to overwhelm us, we let the devil win, don't we? We give the devil his domain that technically he doesn't own. But he proclaims that he does have power in this world, but only if we let him. We have to stay out of our feelings. That's a tough, that's tough, I get it. We have to stay in the spirit. We have to walk with the Lord daily. You're probably thinking, why? Well, <laughs> why because that's what it's going to take to fight the devil if the spirit says yes then yes if the flesh says yes then it says no right if the flesh says no then you say yes it's not that easy is it Lord, is this going to hinder me? Is this going to stop me from my walk? Is this going to, even even if we pray for something we really want, maybe we want a Twinkie. Oh, I like I like a uh, oatmeal pies, or oatmeal cookies. Lord, can I have this? Here, I'll give them to you. But maybe then we can't stop at just one. And we gained 30 pounds. Oh, man, it didn't, huh? That's a lot of oatmeal cookies. But what happened, though? Maybe we, we seek after certain things more than we seek after the Lord. You know? Um, I don't remember who tells the story. There was a lady that was trying to lose weight. And everything that she did wouldn't work. Nothing nothing would work. No diet, no no diet pills, no nothing. Weight watchers, nothing would work. She wouldn't lose she wouldn't lose, but she was on fire and she was she was a mighty woman of God. And she's finally she goes to the Lord and she says, Lord, why can't I lose any weight? And the Lord said because if I allowed you to lose weight, you would be worried about every other man looking at you than worried about me. And she said, let me be fat, Lord. Let me be fat. But that's where we need to get to, where our de- desires are pushed out of the way and we only seek after him. That's a hard place to get to, isn't it? I told the Lord I'd sell everything I own. man will probably be upset about the house, but I'm like, I don't care. I don't want it. Some of this stuff I'm just going to set fire to. It's like I, I don't. But we have to live by the Spirit, walk by the Spirit. Right? We can't give the devil any room to operate. In the Garden of Eden, there was no sickness. No disease, no death. Then sin came. And then disease and death followed. Sickness and death are the they're of the devil. When we allow him to operate, he will fill the place with death. That's how we die spiritually. Whether it's it's physical death or spiritual death, he's gonna he's gonna fill that empty empty space. So you have to deal with him rough, don't we? We have to we have to cast him out. We have to hit him with our weapon. 
If you had a dog like we do, he's kind of goofy. If you left one your house one day and you couldn't take the dog with you, but the dog was trying to follow you, what are you going to do? Go home, go home, go home. It don't work, does it? He keeps following you. The second time, go home, go home. You got to go home. You can't follow me. Then the third time, you're finally going to get sick of it. Get out of here! And he's going to go home. Right? You can't. Is that how we, is that how, that's how we work with the devil? We come in here, we go to the, go to the altar, we go lay it all down, and on our way out, we say, hey, we're still friends, right? Right? Or we just say, get out of here, folly, and be done. And do you like they said this morning? Live the way he says to live. Do what he says to do. Come on, Gracie, I'm going to close. I read a story about a meeting with Smith was having, and in that meeting there were many speakers. We got up and started to the congregation. A man started getting up and speaking in tongues. Smith said to the man, hey, you, up there, shut up. There's no talking when I'm talking. No one else likes tongues better than I do, but don't talk while I'm talking. All the other ministers on the platform were like, oh, they were taken aback. They were like, hey, that was kind of rude, wasn't it? They discovered later that the man was going from place to place doing the same thing. He would, he would just start speaking in a tongue to disrupt service. But Smith discerned that in his spirit, didn't he? And he threw the man out. He also was in a meeting that he was he was by himself and on the platform. And every time he tried to pray, he could feel the spirit was not moving. And so he would he would try to pray, and something was hindering. And he said, "Lord, uh, what's going on? Show me what's hindering this this move." And so the Lord shows him that a bunch of spiritualists had come in the back and they had locked arms and they were sitting on a pew. So Smith gets up or he, he leaves the platform. The whole time he's praying, he's praying, he gets to the spiritualist. He grabs a hold of the pew and he picks it up and says, Out you go, you devils! And he dumps them all on the floor. Well, they got up and left. So he gets up and he said, Man, we had a, the Lord came down and the Lord moved in that meeting. And so after all that, Somebody at the end calls him, and they say, man, you threw them people out. He said, I'm throwing the people out. I threw the devil out. They chose to go with him. That's, that's where we need to be when we walk in the Spirit is to be able to discern where, what, and when we need to act and when we don't need to act, right? We need to walk in the Spirit to know the will and the mind of the Lord, to discern spirits, to show his glory to the lost and dying world. In 2 Corinthians 3, we are told that we are to leave the first principles of doctrine of Christ and go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and other first principles. What would you think if a builder was always tearing down his house and laying a new foundation? We should never look back if we want the power of God in our life. If we allow ourselves to look back, and I'm not saying that we we can't look back to see where we're coming from or we, where he brought us from, but he will allow that in due time. Other than that, we don't look back at the old us, at the old life. We should no longer care what we used to do, what we used to be. Every time that we look at that, we tear up the old foundation to lay a new one. We're going to tear up our house to lay a new foundation? That seems crazy. If we allow ourselves to look back, whether that is to the world, 
to the flesh, to ourselves. It's not to Jesus. We will miss what the Lord asks for us. The Holy Ghost shows us that we should never look back to the law of sin and death from which we have been delivered. God has brought us into a new order of things, a life of love and liberty in Christ Jesus and beyond all human comprehension. Many are brought into this new life through the power of the Spirit of God. And then like the Galatians who ran well in the beginning, they try to perfect themselves on the lines of legalism. The Lord is not pleased with this, for he has no place for the man who has lost the vision. The only thing is to do is to repent. If anything has been tripping us up, we should confess it to the Lord and look to God to bring us to a place of stability of faith where our whole walk will be in the Spirit. If the enemy can move you from a place of faith, he can get you outside of God's plan. The moment man falls into sin, divine life ceases to flow, and his life becomes one of the helplessness. But this is not the Lord's will for any of his children. Read the third chapter of 1 John and take your place as the child of God. God's thought for us is that we shall reign in life by Christ Jesus. We must come to see how wonderful we are in God and how hopeless we are in ourselves. That's the problem is that we start to rely on ourselves too much when the Lord doesn't answer and we're in a test or we're in a trial or a storm and we try to do it ourselves. We try to paddle out, steer ourselves out of it, fight our way out of it. That's why we exhaust ourselves to on belief. The Lord declared himself mightier than every opposing power when he cast out the powers of darkness from heaven. I want us to all realize that same power that cast Satan out of heaven dwells in everyone who was born of Christ. That's where we need to really get to is to realize who we are or whose we are. And what lives inside is greater is he that is in me than he who is in the world. If you stand with me. We'll come to this altar to walk in the Spirit. We, we must be committed to prayer. We cannot walk in the Spirit if we never pray. Prayer is more than a spiritual exercise or a discipline. Prayer is really our lifeline for struggles, for battles, for trials. We use prayer to plug into the power source and to get charged with the power of Christ to fight the devil. This is walking in the Spirit. We commit to reading the Word. We hide it in our hearts to use the sword. It's to learn how to wield it. If I gave you the swords that I used last week in the demonstration, would you be okay? Would you be able to defend yourself with them? We have to learn how to wield this weapon. And we learn by experience through battles, trials and tribulations. We must be committed to obedience. Without obedience, it doesn't matter how much we pray or how much we read the Word. Without obedience, those things are just nice things to do. When we allow ourselves to be led by the Spirit, we find ourselves walking in the Spirit. Father, I've poured out my heart and gave your word to your people. I pray that it will find good ground, Lord. I pray that you would help us around these altars, help us to walk in your likeness, walk in your Spirit, to be like Jesus. Amen.